Um, my name's Glenn. Um, I'm going to be uh, I'm convening the, the Masters and Honours along with Bruce Duran and Sarah Beavis at the moment, and that will be happening on into the future. Um, I'll, I've got some slides that I'll just run through very quickly. The format for this today is really to just give um, potential Masters and Honours students an overview of what, we're, what we do and what the program looks like. Um, and to help answer any questions that you may have. Um, yeah, so as I said, I'm uh, Glenn Althor. I've done a PhD in environmental science uh, and I really love doing the honours program. I've been doing it with Bruce for a while now. It's very fun um, and helping Sarah out with the masters at the moment. Sarah, unfortunately, can't make it today. She might drop in later, hopefully, to say hello. Sarah is the current, uh, will be the co-convener for masters and honours from next semester onwards. Um, unfortunately, Sarah had to be at another lecture, so but she will try and drop in. I think Bruce Duran is here somewhere. He might pop in if I um, get anything wrong. So thank you, Bruce, for being here. Um, we also have Vanita Vito here, who is uh, one of the administrators who looks after the students. So she's the student's best friend. Um, yeah, so thanks, everyone. We also have some past students who will talk to you. Well, I'll let them introduce themselves when we get to that time. And also we've got some of our fantastic academic staff who have some project ideas that they're going to throw around for people. So thanks everybody for being here. If you have any questions as we go, and I love questions, please ask. I can't guarantee I have an answer, but I'll do my best to point you in the right direction. Or we'll also do a bunch of follow-up emails after this, and I'll give you information on that later. But can I please ask if you have a question during this, um, just click the raised hand option in the chat window um, and Vanita or myself will do our best to spot that and you can ask your question. But please do ask questions, jump in. I love that kind of thing. It'll be really helpful and means that it feels less like I'm talking to a little screen in my laptop rather than a um, bunch of interested folks. So thank you very much. Um, very brief schedule here. Oh, sorry, can I just ask everyone who... If you aren't muted at the moment, can you please mute yourself and use that raised hand function? Thank you so much. Um, just a really brief schedule. We probably won't stick to this terribly tightly. I don't definitely don't intend on speaking at you for half an hour. Um, I've just built a bit of time in there for questions. So I'll give you an overview. Then we'll have our past students who have wonderfully offered us their time to have a chat and tell you um, what their experience was like as a master's or an honor student. Uh, and then, as I said, we have some academic staff who will introduce themselves as well. So I've been very generous with the time here. I'm expecting we'll finish before the end, uh, before 1.15, but um, we've got a bit of time there anyway, if we need it. So why do honors? And I'll talk about masters as well as we go. I've just kind of broken this up into the two components. But really, honours is an opportunity for you to become a scientist and undertake a research project. So you can pick a study of your choice that you negotiate with a supervisor. And really, it's an opportunity. For most undergrads, it's the first opportunity to really sit down and think intensively about a topic that, that is of interest to them. And how do you, do you design a research project and plan it? And then you've actually got to go out and you've got to gather data and come back and analyze it and, and all these sorts of things. So it's a wonderful first step as a scientist or as a researcher and, and an academic. Um, you get to apply the, all the wonderful stuff that you've learned as undergraduates. You get to say, well, I learned about endangered species or climate change or something like that, whatever topics really spoke to you. Um, and you can actually apply those skills and that knowledge and you apply that to a real world problem. So it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to do that. Um, you get to work very closely with other academics and folks around at, at mostly in Fenham. There are opportunities. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment about um, working outside of Fenham. Um, sorry, I just realized I've been watching the chat window, but you're all, all up here. So I'll try and watch the camera more. Um, you get an opportunity to work very closely and that's not just with the academics um, and the researchers, although that's a wonderful skills base and you'll work very closely with supervisors. You also get a chance to build a cohort of young, not always necessarily young, but young as in experience wise um, researchers. As you go through, you have a cohort of other honour students and often people make very good friendships and support each other through honours through that. So that's a really 
great opportunity as well. Um, it improves your, improves your employment options. Um, having an honours on your CV definitely looks very good. Uh, so if you're interested in grad programs or moving on to work for a uh, government department, private industry, or even if you want to stick around and do a PhD, that makes you much more competitive to have an honours. Um, and some universities may have honours as a requirement to apply for a PhD. And it can also provide partial credit towards a master's degree if you're interested in something like that later on. Um, so why do a master's? I mean, a lot of this material here is very similar. There's a lot of overlap between honours and masters as far as the value that they bring to people. Masters really is also a more substantial research project. It tends to be um, what that looks like usually as far as quantifying that difference is a larger final piece of work, a larger thesis at the end that you submit. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on as well. Um, but again, doing a master's gives you a chance to do a research topic that you're really interested in, meet new people, meet researchers, make connections, potentially make industry connections and that sort of thing if um, that's a part of your project. It helps to qualify you to apply for entry into PhDs. And also, and this goes for mass, uh, for honours as well, sorry, completing either of these sorts of research degrees means that you're much more competitive for scholarships when you're applying for other um, types of degrees as well, whether it be a PhD or a master's if you've done an honours. So that's very helpful. Um, and yeah, it, it really helps improve, improving your employment opportunities, a bunch of different areas I won't go into that list exhaustively. I think you can imagine that between the private industry, the different levels of government and research organisations, there are many doors that this can open. Um, so any questions on that, please just raise your hand. Um, honours, to get admitted into honours, uh, you need to make sure that you have a distinction average in, in six relevant second or third year courses. Um, you need to make sure that you have a project that's agreed to with a primary supervisor. I'll give you a bit of advice in a moment about how you might go about finding a supervisor and what some strategies around that or how you might go about finding a topic. We'll come to that and that will work for both honours and master students. The project can be your own idea. Um, Often people will come into masters or honours and they'll have worked with say a government department or an environmental NGO or something like that. And they're really passionate about a particular topic and that's what they want to follow. So if you can align that topic with a project that works well and get agreement from a um, family academic to supervise you, that's a great way forward as well. You don't, you're not always expected to be told what your project will be. Sometimes, um, you get an opportunity to come up with those ideas on your own. That will be up to you and your supervisor to kind of no negotiate. Um, your primary supervisor should be an a FENA academic. Um, you can have co-supervisors from outside of FENA and even beyond A and U. Uh, so usually with an honours, you tend to only have one or at most two supervisors because you it's a pretty short, intense program. So you want to keep that supervisory panel to a nice focused group. Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, applications, so once you've come to an agreement with the supervisor, you've got a topic, you've worked out what you want to do, you just, you put in your, your application and that will be reviewed by myself and Sarah. Um, and we may come back to your supervisor and ask some questions, but in most cases, if the supervisor is happy, we're happy. <laughs> um, so FEN is open to students from all different parts of the university. So arts and social science, um, the College of Asia Pacific or science broadly um, and uh, FEN or Environment and Society. Others may be fine. I won't go into an exhaustive list of anything here today, but not this in particular. Um, the best thing to do will be to follow that up. And as I said, I'll give you a good email address for sending follow ups after this and we can answer all your specific questions. Um, you'll start in either February or July and that will, whether you start in semester one or two will really depend on what are your personal um, requirements. So some people want to work for an extra six months or they're really keen to jump in straight away. Um, but you'll need to also make sure that that aligns with when your supervisor is available. Obviously, FEN is an environmental school. So lots of the academic staff tend to travel for research because they're 
you know, could be in the middle of the Pacific or um, continental Africa or something at any time of the year. So you need to make sure they're available. Um, and if they're not going to be in the country that you've negotiated that and, and have a clear idea of how that's going to work. There are part-time or full-time options available. So you can have a think about that if part-time will be more suitable. Again, this is something to follow up with us and we can answer any questions you may have about that. The deadline for this and also for masters, it'll be on that the slide for masters as well, is the 31st of May. Um, so that's coming up fairly soon. So please think about this and also please follow up with us as soon as you like with any questions that you may have and we'll support you as best we can to make sure that you've got all the information you need to know for submitting an application. So masters is a tiny bit uh, more complex in that uh, the, the most important thing to state first is that if you're currently a master's student who's only doing coursework, then you need to apply to transfer to the advanced masters because the advanced masters is what has this 12 month um, research component to it. Uh, so there's a link here and I'll also be sending a follow up document or Vanita will be sending a follow up document that um, lists all these links and things. So don't stress too much if I'm um, clicking past these and you try and don't try and scribble these down or anything. We'll make sure. Um, oh, sorry, someone's just said PowerPoint isn't ch changing slides on the screen. Fenita, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, yeah, it's not changing, Glenn. Can you tell me what slide it's stuck on, sorry? The number one, the first one. Oh, it's changing on my screen. I wonder why. That is, okay, now is it up going. here? Is that changing now? Yeah, it's introduction. Why do honours? Right, okay. Why do masters admission? Okay, yeah. yeah, all right. Can you just keep an eye on that yeah, and okay. let me know yeah, if that yeah. um, happens again? Sorry about that, everybody. I'll very quickly run through those initial slides again, but I've largely just been telling you what's the content in them anyway. Um, thank you. Please jump out if, if that anything like that happens again. Um, uh, yeah, we talked about why you would do these. This is these information in these tables is a bit more specific. And again, this will be in the follow up document that I send through um, that there'll be a list of all these different bits and pieces. So please don't stress yourself with trying to remember all of these different requirements and things at this point. Um, so this is where we're at. My apologies for that. Um, so if you're a coursework student and you're not currently enrolled in the advanced masters and there's a couple different types of those we'll talk about in a moment then you need to apply to transfer to that there's a process and a link for that i won't bore anyone with the details of that now but you can follow that up um, and you can transfer but you will need to meet the uh, re minimum requirements for advanced that all advanced students need to meet to be able to undertake the research component and that's achieving a minimum of a 70% uh, weighted average mark for the initial 48, work, 48 units of coursework. So if you're below that 70%, then um, you may not be able to get into the Masters Advanced. Um, and you'll need to have completed all compulsory courses. So this is where things are a little bit more tricky. It's, it's fine and there's lots of great information to help you navigate it, but there's a couple of different streams for Masters Advance. There's the environmental management, forestry and environmental science. Uh, sorry, not environmental management, just environment. These links here will help you go through and understand what those compulsory courses are. Current advanced students should probably already have a pretty good idea of what they are. But um, if you have any questions, please have a look at that and follow up with us. We can help you with that. Environmental science has some more specific requirements. So please look in at that specifically if you're in environmental science. You may not be able to do um, the master's advanced course that we're talking about here if you're under a specific um, sub program there so please have a look at that and make sure um, yeah again very similar to honors you've got to have a project so again work out a topic that you're passionate about is always a great place to start we'll talk a little bit more about some alternate ways to approach a, 
a um, research project in a moment. Um, your supervisors should be from FENA, um, but your co-supervisors, as, as with honours, can be from outside. Um, and there are also part-time or full-time options available. And the deadline is similar for masters, uh, for honours, my apologies. So semester for semester two this year, it's 31st of May. So please send through any questions urgently that you may have around that. So how to apply. I'm not going to go into the extreme details of this because it um, there's a different process for each. What I would suggest is that, again, I'll send through the follow-up material. Please have a look at which uh, of these applies to yourself. If you're interested in honours, go to the first link, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those processes are pretty straightforward. They're um, listed in detail on the ANU website. So please have a look at that. Um, so where do you get an idea for a supervisor or a project? A really great place to start is if you already have an existing relationship with a lecturer from FENA. So say you've done an undergrad degree at FENA or you did an elective in FENA and you're interested in doing honours and you remember you did a topic with, I'm going to pick on Bruce because he's here, you did a topic with Bruce Duran on GIS and you loved it and you thought all this mapping stuff's really cool, I really love that, I got into it, it was um, really fun. Then what you would do is you would reach out to Bruce or whoever it is that, you, that you're interested in and say to them, hey, you know, I'm interested in doing an honours project or a master's project. I really loved the course that I did. Um, what would you think about that? And you, that's a way to start that conversation um, with, with someone <clears throat> that you've worked with previously as a student to, in their lectures. So that's a good way because, you know, you need to work with your supervisor for pretty intensively for around about a year. So making sure that it's someone who you've got a good relationship and that you know well already is a really nice way to start. It's definitely not the only way to start though, and I don't want to give you the impression that you can only work with lecturers that you know. There's a really, um, there's a couple of really nice pages on the FENA website. Again, all these links and things we'll provide to you later, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, these are, this is kind of roughly what they look like, that there's a list of projects that are currently ongoing. So you can have a look through that and see what sort of projects are in there that you might be interested, that fit your interests as a student and have a look at who's running those projects, have a look at what they're about. That could be a good way to start thinking about, oh, that person, oh, there's one by Bruce Duran who is doing a GIS based project on something that I'm interested in. So that can be a good way to start to identify potential topics and potential supervisors. So those two links are very good to, to look through. <clears throat> um, yeah, I just put this in to remind myself that I didn't forget to talk about this because it's really important at the moment and it has affected, well, everyone obviously, but it has affected students in a particular way. If you're planning on doing a honours or masters at this stage, ANU is, you know, following the social distancing rules as recommended by the Australian government. What that means in practice is that this can be very limiting for the type of project you can do. Don't start imagining that you're going to do a project where you've got a workshop of, you know, 20 attendees and you're all going to sit together in the same room, for example. Um, that's something to think about specifically and seek guidance from a potential supervisor around. Um, that will be specific to each person's project. So there's no point in me listing off a, a bunch of different examples, but most of it will be pretty common sense what you can and can't do. University is obviously not open at the moment. So to, uh, if your project involves a lot of time on campus, that can be limiting. Um, this is still an ongoing situation. So access to labs and things like that, we're still working out. But information on that will be sent out to staff and students as soon as, they, as, soon as it, we have it. Um, but just be aware of that when you're thinking about a topic that COVID-19 really throws things um, a little bit sideways away that you might normally approach a project. Um, so any questions from anyone about anything there? I see my screen's working now, which is good. Um, please let me know, just use that hand up function. All right, cool. 
So what are some of the potential pathways to doing a research degree? So here's a, an idea that I'm not going to take credit for because I totally stole it from Bruce who did this previously, is there's kind of three really neat ways to think about pathways to doing your research degree. So the first path is you have a topic of interest that you're really interested in. You're really passionate about endangered species and orange-bellied parrots in particular and you think wow i'd love to do a research topic that sort of works out how do we um, improve habitat for orange-bellied parrots or something like that so what you would then do is start to look at well who at fenna and you can use those research pages that i showed you a moment ago to say let's find who's doing mapping on orange bellied parrots or who's a biologist looking at the biology or what's the ecological work that's going on around this or who's doing work with birds more generally if there's no one specifically looking at orange bellied parrots and start to think about it that way and then you can go to that person and say hey i've got this really cool topic i love orange bellied parrots and i think that there's something that we can find that's interesting about their habitat movements or the impacts of different landscapes on them or you know whatever it is that this is a very specific example but just to give you an idea of what to think about that might be something around how do different people access food in an urban environment or um, how is climate change affecting coastlines there's a very broad range of topics there and then you would sit down with that person that at the Fenner academic and just sort of refine and agree to the topic so make sure that you're both happy with what your topic would be what you're trying to investigate a rough idea of what your methods will be and that sort of thing and then you would apply for entry so the second idea this goes back a little bit to what i was talking about before is you've got someone in mind you worked with bruce you did his course you're like oh this is great bruce i can't wait to to get stuck into a project with you and then bruce might say well actually i've got this project around orange belly parrots would that be of interest to you again you would sit down and refine that a little bit and apply for entry the last one is um if you've already got a link with an external agency so you might work with a parrot ngo that already does this kind of work in this space and you've got a really well-defined idea of what would be useful for that um, external agency so that could be um, a government agency or an ngo or private or something like that and then again you would look someone up and say oh here we go i found bruce duran he's doing work on this i'm going to approach him sorry for picking on you here bruce but your your name's coming to mind so so, um, and you approach Bruce and say, hey, I want to do this mapping project on, on uh, uh, parrots. So again, refine your topic and agree to it and then apply for entry. So those are some ideas that you can think about. Again, please reach out if you need any more ideas. Um, we're getting on a little bit, so I might not go into too much detail here. The structure of honours and the master's advanced is quite similar. Um, but different in some in some subtle ways. Honours consists of two separate courses. So there's 4001, which is a 12 unit research skills course. And then there's 4000, which is the actual thesis. In practice, these, these are very uh, much overlapped and the research skills is, tends to be revolves around a couple of pieces of assessment, which include a, a few seminars and annotated bibliography, which is for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's kind of like a formal literature review um, and some reflective activities around workshop attendance. So the workshops that we run, there'll be several of those throughout the year. They're designed to give you really good skills and understanding of how to approach a research topic and then prepare it for a thesis and present a thesis. Um, so which leads me into the second part which is to prepare a thesis which is capped for uh honor students at fifteen thousand words and you'll write that thesis based on all of the work that you've done of your designing your project planning your project gathering data analyzing data you need to show that you've really understood your topic and that you can synthesize ideas from the literature and talk about them in relation to your data again i won't go into too much detail with that that'll be something that you'll learn as a part of being a student in this course will guide you through that and then finally there's an oral defense which is supposed to be a process to help students to show that they're to their examiners that they know what they're talking about which all of you definitely will um, then the master's advanced is 
only one course. It's not split into two, but it largely has similar mm -hmm. assessment items. Um, this structure is fairly new at the moment, so it will look different to what appears on programs and courses. So please follow this um, information here and the information that we send to follow this up. So it also involves workshops, annotated bibliography and reflective um, material based on the workshops. And then the real key difference here is that the thesis tends to be longer for and more detailed for a master's. There's no hard limit on the size of that. Most theses come in at around 20,000 words, but this would really need to be if you're going to go over that by a lot, that would need to be negotiated between your supervisor and by uh, Sarah and myself as conveners. Um, and then there's also an oral defence component to that. Um, there's lots of additional information. I won't go through this. This information is, to, I'm just put the, putting this here to show you that there's lots of um, additional information we can send for you to follow up. The most important thing here is this um, questions and inquiries email address. And that's where you should have received, oops, sorry. That's where you should have received information from about this session already. That fses.coursework.enquiries at anu.edu.au is the is a good first port of call for those of you who might have more specific questions or want to follow things up that they'll, that will go through to Vanita, um, who will provide you with excellent support. So um, that's the most important. There's a couple of other links and things on um, the sites that you can follow that are more specific to each of you. And then there's also a special topics course in Fenner where you undertake a small research project. It's almost like a little uh, mini honours in some ways. That's very much worth looking into as well. That's EMVS 3016. Um, again, if you need any questions about that, we'll send it through. Uh, please send it through. Um, there's lots of scholarships that are available for honours and master's students. Um, I won't go into a great amount of detail on these again, but there is further information available about those scholarships and which might be more specific to you and your projects and your needs. Um, uh, there's a list of contacts for Sarah and myself. Uh, Rachel, who's currently on leave, but she's one of the um, coursework officers who you'll be in contact with once you start. And Craig uh, Strong, who's the, um, a Fenner, the Fenner Associate Director of Education. So please reach out to the, uh, the FSES coursework address is your best um, port of first call. But if you have a specific question for myself or Sarah, please, please contact us. Um, so yes, I'll stop talking at you all now. If anybody has any questions for me, you can either ask me now or, or ask towards the end. Otherwise, I'll be quiet and let our previous students talk about their experience as a Fenner student. No questions? Okay, great. Well, I'll stop sharing my screen. And thanks everyone for your patience with the um, Zoom situation as well. So can I just get um, our past students to unmute themselves so I can make sure everyone's here and just start to introduce yourselves and I'll, I'll let you kind of take this over if you like. <laughs> sure, so um, I'll start. I'm Josh. I'm actually still a current honours student, but I'm about to submit in a few weeks time because I started um, mid last year. Um, I'm working on native bee pollination and I'm looking in particular at a genus of native bees called the reed bees. Um, and I'm investigating um, whether they're effective pollinators of some of our agricultural crops. Um, in particular, I'm looking at the rubus crops. So that's um, blackberries and raspberries, um, lurgenberries, things like that. Um, and I did my field work over spring um, down in the Yarra Valley in Victoria. Thanks, Josh. I can jump in. Um, I'm Rachel. I did my honours in 2017 and I'm now doing my PhD at Fenner as well. Um, I am unfortunately the Fenner horror story for having a bad supervisor who was not from Fenner. I want to lay that down. I used all my bad karma and now I have an amazing panel who are all from Fenner that I'm very grateful for. Um, so my honours was a little bit difficult um, just because I did a very big project which was probably too big. I'm looking at how African elephants are responding to climate change. 
um, which is the same topic I'm doing now. Um, it involved three months field work in South Africa, which meant that I, <laughs> out of the 10 months that you have to do honours, I spent three overseas. Um, and um, it took a few extra months to organise it. So I actually started organising my honours in about April the year before, so April 2016, before starting in January 2017. Um, and yeah, and then I took a year off after honours because I needed a break and I worked in science communication and science outreach, which I also really like. And then my secondary supervisor from honours, who is now the chair of my PhD, asked me if I wanted to do a PhD and I decided I wanted to spend more time researching elephants. So here I am. <laughs> um, I guess I'll go next. I'm Aaron. I did my honours in 2017 with Rachel. Um, my honours was in international trade law which is weird for Fenner. Um, it was extra weird because I had no experience in law beforehand. Uh, it surprisingly went quite well. Um, now I'm doing a PhD in international climate policy and politics, um, especially when it comes to sucking out carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. I'll go That's next nice. if no one else wants to <laughs> jump in. Hi, uh, my name's Vicky. I uh, did a master's in environmental science and I switched from the coursework version to the advanced version um, and that was last year and I'm another one of the people that had a supervisor from outside of Fenner and she's actually in the Zoom right now which is Janelle Stevenson. Um, I had a really good experience so <laughs> I'll just contradict Rachel there. Um, my project was looking at using pollen and charcoal to see how landscapes have changed through time and then looking at how that related to cultural landscapes up in far northern Queensland. Um, and for me, it was just a really good opportunity to uh, delve into a subject that really interested me and sort of let me set my own timetable and work at my own pace and that kind of thing. And I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Vicky. And me? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is EJ. You can call me Ian for short. I did my Master of Environment in 2016 and 2018. Uh, my topic is about um, assessing the climate change impacts on suitable cropping land of China supervised by Tim Bao Shi. And now I'm doing my uh, PhD work with Albert Van Dyke on the uh, drought impacts forecasting. So all about the, the modeling and remote sensing. Uh, I did my the advanced program with combined one year Coursework session and the second year with the research. So as an international student, if, although I have some some basic background on the principles, but need to get more familiar with the Fenner academics uh, communities. So that's quite an, a lot of opportunity for me to choose a practical uh, topic for the the t exactly the the ten months work and. I, I did learn about a lot of uh, from the uh, applying the, the climate models, historical uh, climate data sets, and with um, a, a bunch of the remote sensing data sets. As um, I'm doing the, the modeling, so maybe uh, just rely on my laptop with the internet, so less affected by the COVID 19 <laughs> so far. So, yeah, um, a good. Good choice for me. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Louise. Um, I finished anyway honours the same year as um, Rachel and Aaron, and I was doing uh, cross cultural sustainability education, so working between here and the Philippines, um, but also doing that over the internet. So that's turned out to be quite useful for these COVID times on um, sort of practical application how we teach doing that. Uh, yeah, so I mostly worked in Australia, but get to spend some time um, actually over in the Philippines implementing the project that I've been working on. Uh, yeah, honours, I like, I found it really tough, but it worked out well in the end. Now, yeah, it's sort of continuing in that uh, sustainability education. <laughs> Rachel's laughing, but she can tell us about that later if she likes. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, total, um, Upside of doing it with Fenner, I think, has been having that cohort form of work where uh, we have done it otherwise, just in terms of um, the intellectual debate, but also the, the real friendship and stuff that we had. And yeah, lots of us are still friends now. So it's been definitely good. 
Thanks, Louise. Was it, is that everybody? I think that's everybody. I'm not missing anyone, am I? <laughs> no, you're not. That's it, Glenn. Okay, thanks, Vanita. Yeah. Does any? Can I ask if any of the prospective folks in here have any questions for our past students? Because they'd probably give you a really good idea of the experience. Nope. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, so we do have a couple of uh, academic staff who have wonderfully agreed to give us a little bit of their time and are going to show us some potential project ideas that they have that people could uh, look into. So can I ask you to, yeah, please make yourselves <laughs> known and introduce yourself and, and your project that you have. We've just got a question down below. Um, sorry, quickly, Glenn, from Sumi, um, yeah. which is how do you make sure that you plan your project in advance to not be too ambitious, which is a great question. Do you want to have a crack at that one, Josh? <laughs> well, gee whiz, I can give it a whirl. Um, I think it's just sort of a lot of ongoing collaboration and discussion with your supervisor or supervisors. Um, and I think from my own experience, I'd also add um, that you don't need to have it set in stone from the very onset of your program exactly what you're doing and what questions you're approaching. Um, it's okay to have a bit more of a broad context or outlook um, as you begin your project or even as you apply for your project. Um, and then through collaboration and sort of ongoing work with your supervisor, you can sort of begin to, you know, make it more suitable um, after the fact. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that's my, my key thoughts there. Yeah, great, Josh. Yeah, I agree. I think it's one of those things that you have, you come in with a plan and you get a well-defined topic and you kind of have an approach to it, but a part of this kind of a research degree is actually learning how do you manage a topic to not spiral out into all sorts of different um, areas and how do you keep it to a refined, nice little neat package and as Josh is saying, working with other people and working with your supervisors and um, with the conveners as well, we're all here to support you and help you keep your project in a nice, neat package that doesn't get too carried away. But you will learn about that as you go as well. So does anybody else have anything to chuck in on top of that? Yeah, I think I'd say that uh, me and probably everyone else wanted to change the whole world in our honours project. Um, and you can change a bit of it. Change all of it, but you can change a bit of it. But it's also um, it's also a learning experience. So if you can um, cut yourself a bit of slack in that you are producing really great things, even if your project scope seems quite small, because I eventually learned I think that the kind of the narrower you had it, the more you could get into it and do something that was actually that was actually really good, and that was a really hard thing to let go of. Um, but yeah, I suppose ended up with yeah really being able to get into it so it's hard to leave the whole saving the whole world to the side but um, you can do it yeah i think that's very very common certainly my experience in my honors and phd was how do i do everything and then it's really learning well actually it's my job is to work out one specific thing and work out how i can help to resolve that not solve all the world's problems um, yeah, does anybody else have anything to add on to that one? There's some pretty good answers anyway. I'll jump in um, as someone who did a small PhD in 10 months during honours, I think is <laughs> where we settled on how much work I did by accident. Um, that um, I think we do look a lot only to our supervisors for advice. Um, and while most of the time, 99% of the time, that's really good. It can't hurt to get a second opinion from your coordinators or your conveners on the amount of work that you're doing and whether or not it's reasonable or within the scope of honours. And like Louise said, it's so easy to go down like a hundred rabbit holes once you're interested in something. Um, but if it's starting to feel like it's a bit too much, it probably is. And your supervisors might not realise or they might not have specific skills in what you're doing. And so you need to reach out for help. And there's no shame in that. And I really wish that I had done that a lot earlier than I did. So it's not just your supervisors who get the final say in how much work you do um and you should reach out for help if you need it and there's lots of people to help in Fenner, like so many so so many <laughs> yeah that's a really important perspective and it's also part of what sarah and myself are here to do is to support you and so our door will be open for you when you need to come and talk about those things so absolutely really really good advice okay can i get our 
wonderful academic guests to please um, introduce their topics that they have in mind and, and that sort of thing and say hello to the students. Um, I, I can't really see everyone's names because of the boxy window. So if you can just say hi. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in first, Glenn. Um, yeah, so Saul Cunningham here, I want to say two things. First, I'm the director of the Fenner School. So partly I want to say um, welcome. Thanks for joining the, the meeting. And I encourage all of you to to take on on as a master. I think it's, it's an exciting thing to, to do. In terms of what you might do if you worked with me, I'm not gonna pitch a very specific project. You've already heard Josh Coates, who's one of my current honours students, um, talk about his project on pollination by reed bees. I'm interested, if, if anyone out there is interested in pollination questions, or in questions around about pollen itself, where I can, where I sometimes work with Janelle Stevenson, who was in this meeting until moments ago, then um, then I'm interested. So contact me, and I'll talk about possibilities. Thanks. Thanks, Saul. Unfortunately, Janelle had to run, but I think Vicky's going to talk through that for us. Just while I sort out those slides in the background, does somebody else want to jump in? Yeah, Glenn, there's another question there from um, Zoe. Yeah. Okay. Interested in conservation psychology? Yeah, that's a really good question. And interdisciplinary work is one of the big strengths of Fenner. So you will find a broad group of people there disciplinarily. As regards to the specifics of conservation psychology, what I might get you to do, Zoe, is send through a follow-up email on that and we'll actually look into that more closely and see if we can make some links for you within the school. So that's a good question, but um, I won't go into the specifics of that now, but please um, send a follow-up email and we'll chase that up for you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll jump in here, Glenn. Hi, I'm Craig. Um, I work with uh, Glenn and Sarah to help, and Vanita to help um, deliver the education portfolio. Um, really excited that you're thinking about honours and masters. You know, it's a really interesting journey into your own research headspace. Uh, and as a lot of the, pr the current and previous honours students, masters students are saying, it's a really rich environment here in Fenner to dig deep into a whole range of different societal environmental issues. My particular research area is in um, wind erosion, dust, soil ecology. You know, I've got a couple of, uh, and what I try to do is work with external stakeholders, so different agencies. I've got a couple of projects at the moment looking at transported um, components of dust. So there's one at the moment where we're looking at microplastics. Um, how far is it transported? Is it close to source areas? Those sort of things. And then there's another project looking at um, the transport of nutrients then of, that are then feeding freshwater cyanobacterial blooms. And, and then the cyanobacteria then dries, is entrained, and then causes health issues in itself. So there's this theme of particles, organisms, or things being transported in the wind. All right, if anything that of interest, come and have a chat. Thanks, Glenn. Cheers, Craig. Um, Joe? <laughs> uh, Linda, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so um, I have just sort of recently started with Fenner. So I work in conservation genetics. Um, so I've got a couple of sort of project ideas, but if you're interested in um, using genetic tools to address issues in conservation, um, get in touch with me. Our main projects that we're sort of uh, thinking about are um, associated with the Mulligan's Flat Wildlife Sanctuary. So some of you might already know about it, but um, it was, it's got a, a predator-proof fence. And in about 2009, they started a set of re experimental reintroductions um, that have included things like Eastern betongs and Eastern quolls. Um, and this is a really uh, exciting area, exciting group of people to work with, um, trying to not just reintroduce individual species, but 
um, really try and start to understand the entire ecosystem and how we can actually start to restore um, our native ecosystems. Um, so the two projects that um, we think at the moment would be really exciting um, are looking at the diet of eastern quolls and the diet of the eastern betongs. And both of these species um, have been lost from the mainland for many decades. And really all we know about their diet um, comes from the individuals that are left in Tasmania. So we don't have um, a very good idea of what these species are feeding on, what their impacts are on the ecosystem where they've been introduced and with things like the quolls, uh, what impacts they might be having on some of our herbivores that have been reintroduced. So we want to use um, DNA based methods of identification. So uh, looking at the DNA from scats um, of all of these animals that have been collected um, over the last few years to try and have a look at what, what species they're feeding on um, and how this might have been changing uh, over the years since they've first been reintroduced to mulligans. The other project um, that is a, is a possibility is a little bit different. Um, and it's uh, some work I've been doing previously in collaboration with the Australian Museum up in Sydney um, and a whole bunch of other partners around the country. And it's actually trying to use uh, genetic information to track uh, turtles that are in the pet trade. So these are uh, the red-eared slider turtles and they're native to the US and Mexico and they're one of the world's 100 worst invasive alien species. Um, uh, but they are also uh, really, really popular um, and a big part of the pet trade, both illegal and legal and often kept uh, illegally in Australia and then released into the environment either intentionally when people have too many or are worried about getting caught with them or just accidentally through escapes. Um, so this is working with uh, a whole bunch of agencies around Australia, including uh, customs and various museums, um, to look at uh, the genetic diversity in these turtles to try and work out where they're coming from, how similar they are, how many different um, origins there are around the country. So we can try and get a handle on what potential management options there are before we end up with um, an incredibly large population of these things and a sort of second cane toad um, situation happening. So they're the two projects um, that we sort of have ideas for. But yeah, if you're interested in genetics, I'm very happy to come and chat about other potential projects. Awesome. That sounds amazing. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> All the, everybody's projects sound amazing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Joseph Guillaume. I'm a research fellow in the new Institute for Water Futures. Um, I just have one slide I'll share just so you have something to read at the same time. Um, so my specialty is looking at uncertainty management in decision support, especially in model-based decision support. Uh, so, but um, my angle is to look all the way from the maths to the governance so quite a rain, range of different uh, approaches within that. In general, the idea is topics around improving capacity to tackle an uncertain future. Uh, so I've done some work previously on uncertainty communication, have a current uh, honours student looking at Murray-Darling Basin uh, plan, for instance, and how uncertainty was dealt with there. Um, there's a variety of projects we can do around modelling and decision theoretic approaches, so more on the quantitative side. Uh, optimal experimental design and data acquisition planning is kind of this potential for both qualitative and quantitative angles there and more on the governance side about how can we make sure that we have the institutional arrangements and can support organizational change to improve how we tackle an uncertain future. Um, so as part of the Institute for Water Futures, um, we have quite a lot of collaboration both uh, within ANU with Crawford School um, maths, um, I'm blanking now, <laughs> College of um, Environment and uh, Engineering and Computer Science. Um, and we also have a number of partners, including um, state and federal government and irrigation um, and so on. So lots of different opportunities if you're interested in this kind of topic.
Thanks a lot, Joseph. Um, is it? I think that's everybody. Is it? That's right. Okay. So. Well, does so that's fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Whenever I hear about these things, I always think I wish I could go back and start all over again and do a new honours with someone else <laughs> and go in a completely different direction. But um, yeah, so thanks, everybody. Can I ask if any of the um, prospective students have any more questions? Sorry, Glenn. Do you mind if I just? Um... Uh, talk about Janelle's project. Oh, sorry, Vicky. Yes, of course. Um, I'll share my screen with those sl slides. Sorry. Uh, here we go. I'm not going to be able to sell it as well as, as Janelle, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, so a project she's got in mind is um, landscape reconstruction um, in collaboration with the Gunna Kurnai people of the south coast of New South Wales. Um, so basically it's Quite similar to what I did in, in my master's project, you um, there have been some sediment cores collected, um, but there is opportunity to, to do some field work depending on uh, COVID-19 restrictions, which would involve um, heading out into the field, um, getting a bit muddy, taking some sediment cores. And then um, what we do is we bring those back to the lab and process them uh, on campus uh, and extract pollen and chaff off from those to analyze and, and look at how the vegetation has changed and, and fire records through time. So um, I suppose uh, as opposed to a few FENA projects, this might be looking at time periods over the last 100 years, 200 years, we're looking at, you know, 5,000, 6,000 years, that sort of thing. Um, if you could go to the next slide or the one after, I think. Come up. Yeah, so basically it's just a couple of photos showing sort of what we do. Um, and one of the really cool things about this, I think, is that um, there is a lot of variety involved in, in the work you do at, throughout the year. So you do spend some time in the field, uh, then you get to learn a lot of lab techniques, and then you get to um, put a lot of um, uh, the stuff you learned in undergrad or, or uh, the coursework masters into practice when you analyse um, the data and, and you get to know um, a lot of the vegetation that we have in Australia and use the pollen and charcoal as sort of like a clues to solving the mystery of what the landscape looked like in the past, which um, I, find, I found really fascinating. Um, and yeah, it's a really great project, really great lab and supervisors and would highly recommend it. And um, if anyone's got any questions, send them through to Janelle or myself. Thanks a lot, Vicky. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, yeah, so do we have any questions from prospective students? As I said, we'll send through um, a follow-up with all of this information. I know it's a lot to take in all at once. Um, and I'll also uh, include those, a brief overview of each of those projects that we've described. Um, and yeah, put you in contact with hopefully your future supervisors or people to speak to about those sorts of things. Um, I can't see any more questions popping up. So I think we'll call it a day and thanks so much everyone for your patience and for joining Zoom and everything that's happening. Um, we'll send through a really nice uh, list of information that will give everyone the specific details, include all those web links and things that you need. So um, Someone's just asked a question about cost of all this. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Angela, the costs for the courses depend on um, a bunch of different factors whether you're domestic or international, that sort of thing. What's best to do is that information that I'll send through will have links to the different types of courses and you'll be able to see the costs on there. So that'll be the best way to follow that up is to look at what's specific for what you want to do and you can compare those. And I guess also keep in mind in your budgeting um, that there are scholarships available um, yeah. for those things. So yeah, look into that too. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Yeah, that there's um, there'll be a hopefully a um, good list of scholarships there that we've included in here. We'll put in that information that we follow up with as well. Um, but that's a great point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. No last minute questions. Well, if they right. have any questions, they can contact us, Glenn, and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions and send them any information they require. Right. Thanks so much, Vanita. Thanks so much to the staff and students who came along and did a presentation here. That's excellent. Um, is that everybody? Okay. 
Well, thank you. And I'll see you all later. I hope to hear from future students and look forward to uh, hearing about your projects in the future. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.